You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, episode 24, sonnet 23. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not just another not one in your place? place? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? I recently migrated this podcast from SoundCloud to Podcast Garden and have been having a lot of trouble with the new host. As of Saturday, I've now learned how to host and manage the podcast on my own server. Dealing with hosts and providers has taken a significant amount of effort away from the podcast itself, but I can now say with confidence that the podcast is safe and reliable in its final resting place. Of course, I'm now not only recording this episode two days later than planned, but I've managed to bite my tongue. So if you notice a slight lisp, then please note that there's a painful reason for it. Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions, and as importantly, for showing faith in a project I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support the graphic novel adaptation at www.patreon.com slash Fisher King. Every dollar helps breed a page that brings us closer to a beautiful graphic novel that will make the sonnets so much more accessible. And of course, 10 times that dollar will bring you the finished product 10 times faster. Sonnet 23. Sonnet 23 is precisely the kind of sonnet that frustrates me when I read others' analyses of it, in particular because contemporary interpretations rely on modifications to the original 1609 quarto text. After clearly establishing a theme of writing and reading in the 22 sonnets prior, some scholars have modernized the word books to looks, which radically changes the meaning of that line and those that follow. I will say this now, and I will repeat it towards the end of the episode. I don't think that there is a single misprint in the entire sonnet sequence. I strongly believe that Shakespeare worked side by side with Thomas Thorpe to ensure the perfectly accurate printing of the only work of his that he would ever publish. With that out of the way, Sonnet 23 is another plea from Shakespeare and the Sonnet to the reader, requesting that the reader lend the sonnets their voice and read the sonnets out loud. As an unperfect actor on the stage, who with his fear is put besides his part, or some fierce thing replete with too much rage, whose strength's abundance weakens his own heart. So I, for fear of trust, forget to say, the perfect ceremony of love's right, and in mine own love's strength seem to decay, or charged with burthen of mine own love's might. O oh, let my books be then the eloquence, and dumb presages of my speaking breast, who plead for love and look for recompense, more than that tongue that more hath more expressed. O oh, learn to read what silent love hath writ, to hear what eyes belongs to love's fine wit. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 23. The primary intention of this sonnet is relatively straightforward. For example, the first quatrain is discussing an untrained actor being thrust on stage into a role he hasn't prepared for. As in all the sonnets, however, there are additional layers that are intriguing to explore. As an unperfect actor on the stage, who with his fear is put besides his part, or some fierce thing replete with too much rage, whose strength's abundance weakens his own heart. Unperfect actor implies not just a lack of mastery of the role, but not really being suited for the role in the first place. The word actor meant an overseer, guardian, steward, an agent, someone engaged to act on stage, play the part of, plead a cause at law. The sonnets are actors playing the role of Shakespeare. They are the guardians and stewards of Shakespeare's legacy, his spirit captured in text and they serve as his agents as his legal representation in the court of public opinion. The reader, however, is precisely an unperfect actor because they are thrust unprepared into the role of reading Shakespeare's lines out loud, 
They are also, as is qualified by Sonnet 130's, My Mistress's Eyes Are Nothing Like the Sun, far from the ideals of beauty as dictated by traditional sonnet sequences. A stage is a raised platform used for public display, and also the platform beneath the gallows, from the Old French. The sonnet sequence is a platform for public display of the sonnets, the stage on where they act, and it's where Shakespeare hangs them. Both these meanings connect with established themes. Stage also implied a stage or rest in a journey and period of development or time in life. And these are also relevant as the sonnets are traveling on a journey through eternity and each reader is a stop, a period of time they can experience while briefly exposed to the light. According to the Arden sonnets, put beside his part meant forgets his lines, loses his mastery of his role. Part was the technical term for the lines and cues to be learned by an actor. Personally, I think it goes further and infers a separation between actor and role, with the actor being the sonnet and Shakespeare being the role, and the sonnet's position literally beside the bard. Fierce is a puzzling word, as it originally meant proud, noble, bold, haughty from Old French, became ferocious, wild, savage, cruel, and occasionally in Shakespeare's day was used as dangerous, destructive, great, strong, huge in number. It's important to note here that what's being described by the adjective fierce is thing, and while contemporary interpretations of this consider it to mean a savage beast or human being, I'm of the opinion that the fierce thing full of the poet's passion is the text, this sonnet or the book of sonnets, recalling Hamlet's famous quote, the plays the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. All the possible meanings of the word fierce are appropriate, including that of numerous. The text is invested with the poet's rage, which as previous sonnets have discussed, needs to be tempered in order for their message to be communicated effectively. The abundance of strength weakening the poet's heart, or at least weakening the arguments of his heart, follows these reflections accordingly. Heart here has been interpreted as courage and determination, but, as has already been established, and which came up a few times in the previous sonnet, is also a metaphor for the soul, love, and spirit. The more passion Shakespeare invests into his heart's reflection, the sonnets, the weaker his own heart becomes. This idea was introduced all the way back in the first sonnet. Feedest thy light's flame with self-substantial fuel, making a famine where abundance lies. And lo, he uses the same word, abundance, to link these lines directly, a word that only appears four times throughout the entire sonnet sequence. So I, for fear of trust, forget to say the perfect ceremony of love's right, and in mine own love's strength seem to decay, or charged with burden of mine own love's might. Fear meant the same as it does today, but also carried the meaning of feeling of dread and reverence for God, and I believe it's strongly connected to the earlier word fierce and the French fier. Trust is a loaded word, carrying reliability, trustworthiness, fidelity, faithfulness, confident expectation, that on which one relies, a legal sense of confidence placed in a one who holds or enjoys the use of property entrusted to him by its legal owner, and the condition of being legally entrusted. Those last two tie into the established legal theme, but also work as a description of the sonnets as the legal entities holding and enjoying the words and ideas that their rightful owner has entrusted to them. Ceremony meant a religious observance, a solemn rite, but also a mere formality by the mid-16th century. Rite meant just, good, fair, proper, fitting, straight, not bent, direct, erect, and honest, true, and correct. It was probably also a play on the word rite, meaning religious observance or ceremony, custom or usage, which would render the line the perfect ceremony of love's rite a tautology. O charged with, Catherine Duncan-Jones reads this as 
weighed down with and crushed with the charge or responsibility. But I believe that the original text's spelling as or charged may have been intended to mean charged with ink, the ingredients of which included iron sulfate and of which I'm confident that Shakespeare would have been familiar with. Iron sulfate played an important role in alchemy, and Shakespeare's sonnets are a form of alchemy. Ever since Sonnet 18, I've been considering alchemy to be an established theme that begins with the refiguring discussed in Sonnet 6. After running a search through the original text, this reading appears to be borne out in 14 other sonnets as well as a lover's complaint. You can find the numbers of those sonnets in the description of this episode. If this was the intention, then we can make a case for the ceremony, or rite, being a form of alchemy, or spell casting. Burthen is an alternate way of saying burden. Originally it was a load, weight, charge, duty, but also a child, and in Shakespeare's day included the sense of refrain, or chorus of a song, which originated in the 14th century's bass accompaniment to music from the old French bourdon. In addition to the contemporary interpretation of this line as continuing the earlier comparison to an enraged beast, the implications of a child and bass accompaniment bring us back to the framing theme of the sonnets being little sons, or replacements for Hamlet, and the musical theme established in Sonnet 8 based on sonnets being little songs. From Shakespeare to the sonnet, the second quatrain would then read, I, an actor, out of pride for what I have entrusted to you and fear for it, forget to adhere to the formalities and traditions of love. The more of my strength I invest in you, the closer I come to death. You are charged with ink and are the duteous song child that is a product of the power of my love. From the sonnet to the reader, the second quatrain reads, I, an agent of Shakespeare, for fear of trusting you, forget to adhere to the formalities and traditions of love. I am so full of love that I seem to be in danger of self-destruction, or coming across too strongly to be believed, and I am ink-charged with the duty of carrying Shakespeare's power. O oh, let my books be then the eloquence, and dumb presages of my speaking breast, who plead for love and look for recompense, more than that tongue that more hath more expressed. Book meant a main subdivision of a larger work, writing and written document. Shakespeare's books, those he draws inspiration from, those he writes to, and especially his sonnets, will speak on his behalf. They are dumb because written words cannot speak themselves, and they are portentous, ominous, informing the future and preceding and anticipating the audible speech of those that will read them. In the ardent sonnets, Catherine Duncan Jones states that presage normally carries connotations of foretelling the future, but in Venus and Adonis, Shakespeare applied it to Adonis's silent blush, an ill presage of the words he is about to speak. Shakespeare himself would have read the words aloud after writing them, even if only to make sure that they sounded as intended. When we, the readers, read these words aloud, we read the words, dumb presages of my speaking breast, from our own speaking breasts. The words here in this sonnet are pleading for love and looking for reciprocation from the reader, which would serve as compensation for Shakespeare's efforts as established in the borrowing and lending theme from Sonnet 4. The word tongue means tongue, organ of speech, speech, a people's language, and here applies to both the sonnet which serves as Shakespeare's tongue and the reader's literal tongue. The repetition of the word more in more than that tongue that more hath more expressed recalls the repetition of the phrase ten times from sonnet six, and the last line of the third quatrain can be understood to be saying that the more words, the more sonnets, the more love and pleading for love would be expressed. The more experienced the reader's tongue, in general or specifically in reciting the sonnets, the more love will be expressed and the more the act of reading will compensate Shakespeare for his investment. O oh, learn to read what silent love hath writ, to hear what eyes belongs to love's fine wit. Fine meant perfected, of highest quality, from Old French, which evolved to rich, valuable, 
costly, true, genuine, faithful, constant, expertly fashioned, well or skillfully made, and delicately wrought. All of these meanings fit well with the established themes in describing Shakespeare's sonnets. The Arden sonnet suggests that silent love is a reference to Sidney's astrophil and Stella's dumb swans, not chattering pies, do lovers prove. They love indeed who quake to say they love. It also states that to hear with eyes negates the commonplace assertion that love is blind. Instead, love is claimed to read or to discern with sharpened insight. Now, that's all well and good, but these lines contain something much more profound, while literally much more superficial. The original 1609 quarto text presents a challenge to the reader, to hear wit eyes, W-I-T, and belongs to love's fine wit, W-I-H-T. Wit meant mental capacity and ability to connect ideas and express them in an amusing way. Wit, W-I-H-T, in the 16th century was an alternate spelling to W-H-I-T and meant amount, usually a tiny amount, or human being, and originated in the Old English word white for living being, creature, person, something, anything. I do not for one second believe that Shakespeare's sonnets contain even a single misprint, as I've discussed before, and it is my opinion that the last line of this sonnet is intended to be a puzzle for the reader. The instruction is to learn what silent love hath writ, and what silent love has written is the final line of this sonnet that must be read and spoken correctly in order to complete the perfect ceremony of love's right that will seal the love between Shakespeare and the reader. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording this podcast, converting these podcast episodes into a book, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. Once again, I need your help to make this happen. Please consider signing up to support this project at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. Keep up with the graphic novel progress at sonnetcomics.com and join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnetcomics with an X. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say, say I'm not, not just another one in your, your place? You're, you're the, the pretender. pretender. What, what if I say I will never surrender? surrender.